for the second session of the day. As people use more and more digital devices to connect with customers, companies and brands, the need for great digital customer experience is more pressing than ever. We are happy to have with us Mr. Ajit Nair, who would take us through digital guest experiences. May I request Dr. Neeta Thomas to share a few words of introduction about Mr. Ajit Nair. Over to Dr. Neeta Thomas. Good morning and welcome back to the next session. Artificial intelligence derives surveillance systems that can issue traffic violations, image recognition programs that can help doctors diagnose diseases and suggest therapies. Now we see its steady integration into the world of hospitality. Importantly, artificial intelligence not only help us better engage guests, but also empower and expand the capabilities of the staff at the time of intense labor pressures as we emerge from this pandemic. We have with us a dynamic contributor to the digital world of hospitality, Mr. Ajit Nair. Mr. Nair holds a MS degree in hospitality information management and a bachelor's in hotel management. He is a hospitality and travel technology veteran with 25 years of experience. He has provided strategy, advisory, and technology consulting services to industry giants like the Marriott's, Starwood, McDonald's, and cruise companies like Carnival and Royal Caribbean, to name a few. He is a co-founder and a chief marketing officer of CAMCOM, an award-winning AI platform for visual inspections. He led the team that developed the first virtual reality and augmented reality showcase for a tourist destination in India and has featured as a speaker at several conferences. He is a history and politics junkie with a passion for travel off the normal roads. Over to you, Mr. Nair, for this wonderful session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dinakaran and Dr. Thomas. I hope you can all hear me very, very well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, good morning from Dubai. How are you all doing today? In many ways, it's kind of overwhelming to be with what 160 something people uh, and all of you hospitality veterans. I call myself a veteran who fell down by the roadside in many ways on in as far as a hospitality journey is concerned. Uh, my hotel management uh, degree is from Christ, as was pointed out uh, by Dr. Thomas earlier. Very good memories about uh, hotel school. At the same time, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'm talking to you immediately after a session with Dr. Beldona. Now, those are giant shoes to fill. Okay, so let's set those expectations a bit below. Dr. Beldona, fortunately for me, has been my mentor, philosopher, as a matter of fact, my thesis research guide as well. Most importantly, a very good friend of mine, a person to whose knowledge in hospitality I'll defer to any day. So please set your expectations a bit below that of what Dr. Beldona has taken you through. As I've said, you know, I'm a, I'm a hotelier by passion, by vocation, but have I worked in a hotel? The answer to that is actually no, I have not worked in a hotel. But then on the other hand, what, you know, Christ College, thanks to Dr. Kariel, Dr. Chatham Parambal, Dr. Jane Matthew, um, I have a fairly solid understanding of the hospitality dynamics. And most of my uh, colleagues, classmates from those days have gone on to make a large name for themselves in the hospitality industry. Uh, some names that I would like to call out are Junaid Rafiuddin, uh, the person who runs the Bistro, Bangalore Bistro chain of uh, uh, restaurants in uh, uh, Bangalore. And uh, of course, uh, Suji Mani, who is actually one of the most famous HR consultants, famous for as the hospitality industry is concerned, uh, Belhem uh, uh, Consulting Services. Uh, Christ has been a fantastic learning experience for me in terms of what Dr. Beldauna would call inculcating the academic fundamentals of where I, where I am today. Um, yes, of course, it goes without saying that I was a bit of a rogue in those days and Dr. Jane Matthew, if he's on this, will also attest to the fact I'm probably one of those very few guys who got suspended every year that I studied in Christ. But in many ways, I think that was essentially a stepping stone for me 
to 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 essentially uh, you know get up the ladder and pull myself and kind of make something out of myself in on, along the way. Um, Dr. Thomas, uh, during the introduction, mentioned that uh, I hold a master, master's degree in hotel management, that I hold a master's degree in hospitality information management. But in many ways, I call myself, uh, like I said, a hotelier by vocation and passion, uh, and definitely not a technologist, because I do not write a single line of code. I very happily stand up in front of my customers and I tell them, Java for me is good coffee. It has got nothing to do with technology. And that is actually true. I do not write a single line of code till date. You know, I'm 48 years old and I still don't write a single line of code, despite the fact that I've been working in the hospitality products and services uh, industry, specifically the technology products and services industry for the last 25 plus years. Uh, I guess what the basis of hotel management has given to me is the fundamentals essentially enabled me to look slightly over what would typically be the case for most people who are associated with operations. When I moved into technology, I got an eagle's eye view of how a small change that could potentially happen at the restaurant, for example, of a Marriott, could have a worldwide repercussion when it comes to essentially the changes that happens in the systems and the decision-making process that happens because of these systems across the world. And that is essentially my uh, core area of focus. I'm a technology consultant who essentially looks at how systems can be rolled out. Now, uh, the reason for that is because after I uh, finished my hotel management, I joined this company called Fidelio. Now, Fidelio in those days was essentially considered to be the gold standard uh, when it came to technology. And I was very lucky to be one of the, uh, 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 you know, probably I think the 15th or 16th employee of Fidelio. And I was also part and parcel of developing that product, uh, which uh, even today I think is considered to be one of the uh, uh, best products ever made for hospitality, Fidelio version 6. Of course, now it has become Oracle Hospitality over the period of time. But like I said, I'm neither a hotelier nor a technologist. I'm just a random observer, in many ways, a passive observer. I observe things, and that in many ways has essentially helped me understand convergence. How does technology essentially fit into the hospitality space? And how that can put that can have huge value over a period of time. But at the end of the day, you know, if I were to go to a hotel management or to a hotel general manager, which I did during my early days when I was trying to sell Fidelio, I remember walking into a hotel, I think it was at Addison in the Gold Coast in Australia, and I was telling the lady about why a loyalty management system that was developed by Fidelio had to be brought to her, brought by her, and she essentially turned around and said, Ajit, loyalty is for dogs. Human beings are only incentivized. They cannot be loyal to anything. You need to incentivize them to essentially move to the next step. So multiple learnings in terms of how technology can essentially play a positive role and a negative role in the hospitality space. Um, what do I do today? Uh, I essentially founded a company in 2017, which essentially deals with visual inspections. Now, what are visual inspections? Every product that is made in this world essentially has uh, steel, metal, primarily, glass, and plastic. Now, all these products that we consume on a daily basis, essentially the base building material is the same. Uh, it's only the, the combination changes, the form changes. Uh, looking at the number of damaged products that were coming out, I felt it was imperative that technology steps up to find a solution for it because, don't get me wrong, human beings are, have the best cameras in the world, which are our eyes, but we have a very, very subjective processor, which is our brain. And that is honestly what makes it different from the rest of the animal kingdom because human beings are able to come to conclusions based on balance of concentration. But in the case of quality and uh, uh, specific areas like that, we need human beings to be objective. We need them to be consistent. And we need to essentially remove ourselves from the process, which is something that you know COVID has taught us as well. We need to be contactless. Now, visual inspections don't lend itself for that. And that is where we felt that it was important to essentially create a solution for that. And that is essentially the genesis of CAMCOM. Does CAMCOM have anything to do with the hospitality industry? My honest answer to that is no. Uh, for the simple reason that despite having spent all these years in the hospitality industry, I can't think of a specific use case, though I have been searching around trying to find that use case for the longest time. Now, this is uh, essentially the backdrop. And uh, let me get into the topic of the day. Allow me to share my screen.
You can all see my screen, yeah? Yes, sir. Well, I, I guess this 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 slide is more or less uh, uh, evident. You know, we live in days where disruption is the main word in many ways. So to take something that Despert has wrote a long time back, you know, I think therefore I am. I have essentially taken the liberty of adding another word to that, which essentially means I doubt, which is essentially propounded by Antoine Leonard, uh, who said that well, if you know, I think therefore I am. That essentially means that I accept the fact that I am here. So therefore I'm not doubting it. Now in today's world, thanks to COVID-19, I think we are in a situation where we are doubting everything in terms of the fundamentals of our industry, in terms of how this is going to pan out over a period of time. We are seeing people work more and more virtually. We are, we are actually under the impression that a lot of people may not come back to hotels. The industry as we have known it is undergoing radical change and so on and so forth. So that is the reason why I put that line there saying that I doubt and that is therefore I think and therefore I am because the doubt is essentially coming from this huge disruption that we have faced over the last two years thanks to this thing that we cannot see, we cannot, uh, uh, you know, in, in many ways feel except for the time when we get uh, affected by it and then of course we feel very well, but we cannot see it and in many ways it is turned around the way that we essentially look at how our industry has to move forward. Now. Here, I would like to talk about a person that I look up to in the in the hospitality world. And his name is Adrian Zaka. Most of you may be familiar with him. The founder of Aman Resorts. Now, I uh, you know I have had the opportunity to sit with him and have a long conversations during the time that I was with Michael Studelio and when he was setting up Aman Resorts in Indonesia. Now, Adrian essentially came with a a, a, a thought process which essentially said that service is something that has to come from the heart. And that is the reason why I'm saying that the future of the industry is brown. Again, I'm not talking about brown people. What I'm saying is that it is moving away from the West to the East in terms of how we essentially define the way that the hospitality industry is moving forward. Now, Aman Resorts, uh, when Adrian uh, was essentially talking to me that day, he essentially said, if that service comes from the heart, and you will, he gave me a, a simple example. We were actually sitting in a lunch pool next to the villa of Aman in uh, Bali. And it was afternoon and, uh, you know, both of us were uh, having a discussion and then both looked at each other and said, um, hung, uh, thirsty. And uh, then suddenly the person, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the bearer, the, the waiter walks up and says, gentlemen, would you like to have a beer? I mean, that is what he said is essentially service that comes from the heart, the ability to be proactive, the ability to anticipate. And these are things that essentially are inculcated right from the beginning in as far as uh, the Eastern philosophy of hospitality is concerned. I mean, in India, we call it Vasudeva Kudumbagam and all that stuff. But I think that that whole focus of moving away from, you know, cookie cutter examples that we have created in the West, be it the, the Marriott's of the world or the Starwoods of the world and the others, we are essentially moving away to a more defined trend line. And people essentially want those trends to be taken into account as opposed to headlines, right? And that is why we, I personally feel that we are moving away from the whole model that has been created around the hospitality industry by the likes of Marriott, by the likes of Wyndham's, et cetera, to a more eastward thinking in terms of what is it that people want and then create our solution of the hotel around the philosophy of what is it that they would like and what is trending? Because millennials today are all about trends. So we need to be able to identify the way in which the hospitality industry is moving forward, especially so in the times that we live in, thanks to COVID, the disruptions that have happened, the number of job losses that have happened, the fact that people are traveling. Well, are people not traveling? That is something that I will get into in just a moment as well. Um, in this instance, I would also like to talk about one pet peeve that I have, uh, given the fact that I have a captive audience of some of the most eminent uh, uh, hospitality educators in India. For the life of me, and this is something that I had actually mentioned during one of my conversations with uh, Dr. J. Matthew and the others at Christ, is the way that we need to relook at the way that our curriculum is currently built in terms of how we educate the future leaders of hospitality, which is what you're doing. You are the guides and philosophers of the future leaders of hospitality. We need to look at how we can essentially bring in more components of this eastward focus as opposed to the westward focus. And a simple example of that is the usage of French. 
Now, for the life of me, I've never been able to understand why we essentially insist that people have to learn French as a language over three or four years when the actual usage of French terms is primarily limited to F&B production and F&B service. When the largest number of people in this world who speak languages and who they should necessarily be conversing with are the likes of Mandarin, Arabic. Why, as a matter of fact, in India, the last time I uh, was speaking to the general manager of uh, the uh, of a resort in Lucknow, they were saying the best managers have come to me from the south, but unfortunately, they are unable to converse in Hindi. Maybe those are the language skill sets that we need to essentially bring into our curriculum, as opposed to being limited to a language like French, because we think that is the way that the hotel management industry is moving. It is not. It is moving. It is no longer centered in the West. We need to necessarily move eastwards and create our own little silo through which we can essentially train the future leaders of tomorrow. Um, you know, in this instance, I would also like to talk about something that happened recently. That during COVID, um, during the, you know, the first lockdown in Bangalore, I and my wife uh, went and adopted a pup. Oh, um, it's just 21 days old. So immediately after the lockdown, we decided to go out and spend some time because he also was cooped up in his apartment for the longest time. We decided to go to uh, the Tamara Resort in Kurt. The Tamara Resort is essentially what I'm talking about, a trend line versus a headline, right? The Tamara is essentially built on the oldest coffee plantation in Kurt. And the way that they have essentially designed their uh, infrastructure is that it does not in any way uh, destroy the existing ecosystem, etc. The most important thing that we wanted, having been put up in the house all the time, was to move away from Wi-Fi and to move away from television. And these are the two things that we did not find there. Now, Pradagaran, who is my uh, dog, absolutely loved the place because he had all the time to run around in the world. And during that time, despite the lockdown, one thing that we realized, me and Maya and my wife, is that we were talking more in that resort because of the fact that we were not connected to the world. Now, connectivity is very, very important. And that is why I will take you into that in terms of the ubiquitousness of the maps, the mobiles, the variables, et cetera, and how that essentially plays a role in the hospitality industry. But at times, it's also important to identify from a hospitality perspective, is technology becoming too much? And that is an answer that we need to essentially answer. And that's a question that we need to answer and find a way in which we can bring it into the hospitality educational system as well. In COVID era, I think the future of travel is in cities. But that is a huge disruption happening in what we call the major cities. I think the smaller tertiary cities are becoming more and more important. A simple example is a number of people who left Bangalore to go back to their hometowns uh, for example, in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu or other parts of the world, because they felt if I'm working from home, I might as well be closer to my uh, to my parents or to my uh, family who's living in other cities. What that has done is essentially created city-centric uh, ecosystems where hospitality can thrive. I mean, uh, to give you a simple example, I was reading a news article about immediately after the first lockdown where the government of Kerala had essentially floated a global tender inviting people to set up near home infrastructure for IT uh, companies. And I was thinking, why on earth do we need to create new infrastructure for that when we already have that infrastructure? You look at the number of hotels that have sprung up all across India in the secondary and the tertiary cities, which essentially offer comfortable rooms, they have bars, they have restaurants, they have uh, meeting rooms, etc. If they could essentially provide packages that would enable a person, uh, for example, an IT professional, who has to take calls on a minimum three days uh, a week, uh, if he's at home, there is every chance, likelihood that there is the, the you know mixer grinder running in the background, or there is children running around, etc. But if you give him a package that would enable him to use that, it would have essentially given a fill up to the hospitality industry in that area, and it would have led to the creation of more jobs, especially in a disruptive area that we are working in. But at the same time, I am completely of the opinion, even today, based on my observations, that the future of travel is very much in cities. People go out of the cities primarily for experiences, but the bulk of the travel is still going to very much happen within the cities. And the locals first is something that, you know, earlier John Willard Marriott had talked about putting customers first. Subsequently, Isidore Sharp at uh, Four Seasons essentially took that a step beyond and said, okay, how do I make my, my uh, staff look more at the business traveler and the discerning uh, traveler? You know, so in, in many ways, these are all philosophies that have existed in the West before, but the East is taking it up 
and essentially giving it a very, very different spin. Um, the ubiquitousness of technology is obvious because you know the, 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 the mobile phone that we carry in our hands actually has more horsepower than the uh, technology infrastructure that launched Sputnik. So, you know, we, we are in a connected world. I mean, 10 years back, you know, people would say that, okay, uh, a, a phone is useless without the human hand. I mean, today I would say the other way around because the hand is useless if you don't have a phone because it has come to a level where we have become so dependent on these small devices, which are essentially breaking down barriers of communication, breaking down barriers of trust. You know, today, technology is uh, actually has more trust. Something that is essentially derived from technology has more trust than a human actually saying that. So, technology is going to be ubiqu ubiquitous. Technology is essentially going to be the differentiating factor, without doubt, in terms of how we go about selling the hospitality products that we create. But at the same time, we need to draw a clear line in terms of what is technology, how much of that should be used, and what is too much of technology. So, in that instance. I'd like to talk about the country that I'm in right now. I'm speaking to you from Dubai. I moved here on the 4th of December to set up my office. In Dubai, uh, you know, unlike a lot of the other countries in this world, yes, every country at the beginning of the had a major reaction to the way that it essentially reacted. Subsequently, from December through to now, six months, I've seen that they moved from a a knee-jerk reaction to a very calibrated response in terms of how they want to look at the economy. And this is an economy, as you can very well imagine, that is primarily dependent on trade and tourism. The way that they have gone about doing that and the way that the hospitality industry has essentially come together to create a better environment in this uh, you know, post-COVID era is what I have actually listed here. It's the complete unbundling of travel services. They have essentially created a situation where the entire thing has been unbundled, where people only take what is needed. Think about it as something like a smorgasbord, right? A smorgasbord has a multiple uh, things on it which you can eat either, or you can either take one, or you can either take multiple of them, or a variety of them, club it together. Unlike a buffet, right, where we essentially pay for stuff that we don't eat as well, or a, a la carte where we order only one. But what if I want one plus half of this and three quarters of the other? So that kind of a smorgasbord of uh, uh, services is currently what I see happening in this part of the world. And I, I think that is a good trend uh, to move forward. We are talking about headlines versus trend lines. I mean, the headlines is all about uh, the hospitality industry going under, the hospitality industry at its worst. But here I see people living up to essentially what can be done. To And by that, they are essentially creating trends which enable them to market their products better. And for that, obviously, the bedrock is definitely technology. <coughs> the other thing that they've done in this part of the world is the creation of the bubble. And there again, technology has been the single most important thing because right now they are going into the World Expo, which will start in October 21. Immediately after that, Qatar is hosting the FIFA World Cup. So they have essentially created a bubble in this part of the world, which enables seamless travel. And all of that is being controlled through one single app, which in turn essentially, you know, collects data from multiple other sources, enabling people to decide what they want, where they want, how they want it, etc. And all of that is currently being driven through technology. <coughs> Future, as I mentioned about the... Uh, uh, kind of uh, trends that are happening in this part of the world and around the world as well. I mean, if you look at uh, the most trending uh, getaway vacation right now in the Middle East is at the Bear Grylls camps. I'm sure most of you would have heard of Bear Grylls. He posts this amazing program on Nat Geo. So how you survive out in the wild. Now, Bear Grylls has set up these no frills camps in places like the Ras al-Khaina, in Hatta, in uh, Alulu, in Saudi Arabia, etc., where people are essentially going there to more or less completely unwind, create a new experience, and bring that to life, to their normal life, because of the disruption that COVID has created in our lives. For that, what they have done is essentially created these tent camps in the middle of nowhere where you are essentially given just the basics. And, but at the, what, what, what the most important thing there is the ability to understand the nature, 
from the perspective of being able to live off nature. A higher version of that would be the hip cat, which is essentially becoming very, very popular in the United States. And then, of course, there are getaways, uh, which is another company that has uh, been created. The student hub is the student hotel, actually, the most happening uh, brand right now across the world because students, they essentially cater to only students and they have essentially done a very good job of doing that. Think about it as old YMCA youth hostel, hostels, but catering to millennials. So the way that they have essentially designed the product using technology has essentially changed the way that people perceive these products. <coughs> I don't know if any of you have come across this uh, very interesting restaurant that is there in uh, uh, Japan. Uh, it is actually run, it's, it's called Forgotten. And uh, the people who run that restaurant are Alzheimer patients. Obviously, they forget and they go to the table and they pick up uh, uh, orders. And many a time, those orders are not essentially the orders that are placed by the customer. But that is also an experience. So the, that the, the ability to, I've said, it's just the ability to evolve from a dialogue to a digital, but it's also the other way around. The digital platform enables the dialogue also to continue. Finally, hospitality is about people. It's, it is about our ability to talk to people and create that empathetic cord. Technology can help in multiple ways from an operations automation perspective in terms of communication, in terms of ensuring that a seamless interoperability between systems, all of that can happen. But finally, the human is going to be critical in the way that we essentially go out and look at the hospitality industry from a technology perspective as well. Society of the millennials. I, I, I was uh, listening in on to the last uh, bit of the conversation that uh, Dr. Belgono was having with the rest of you, and I think one of you asked a question about millennials. And this is my take on what the millennials and the next generation just want. They are driven by the fact that you know happiness, passion, diversity. There's a significant amount of individuality. It is an I as opposed to a we. But that we is also very important for them, but that I takes precedence over we in many ways. So, and each one has a specific distinct taste that the product has and she has to be created around. So if you are able to create happiness using technology, by all means, because they are essentially going to look at that as a USB. The passion is what you are essentially catering to because you are need to understand their passion first. They are a sharing economy and they're an instant gratification economy. And you need to be able to match up to that as well. Most importantly, they don't consider themselves bound by national boundaries. They are international citizens in many ways. And because of which the global community is extremely important for them. Which essentially means that the technology that we essentially use to drive a lot of these has to necessarily be ubiquitous, by which I mean the mobile phones is the most ubiquitous piece of technology we are carrying. The efficiency of that mobile phone in, in the ability to communicate, the user interfaces that enable the ease of use, and how do you connect in converse? The connection and converse, the conversations typically happen between the social media platforms that we are already very well aware of, right? the Instagrams of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the LinkedIn's of the world, etc. Now, this is essentially where I say, from a technology perspective, this is what, what they want. This is what we need to focus on to use technology to get to them to that level. So a very simple example of where people get it wrong. On the one side, you see the Sarovar hotels, which is 75 hotels across the world, most of which are in India. And look at their landing page on the website, the Sarovar hotels website versus Airbnb, right? If I'm a person looking for Delhi, look at the, how Airbnb has packaged Delhi and the experiences of Delhi versus hot Sarovar hotels. This is what technology can do. This is what content can do. This is what understanding of what this disruption means and how that disruption can essentially be capitalized on by the industry means. Game changes, without doubt, you know, everything is being put on to a mobile device. Virtual reality, people nowadays essentially want to take a virtual reality tour of the world before they actually go to that destination. A lot of players already in that space, augmented reality, the ability to stand in front of the uh, Taj Mahal hold up my phone and essentially be told what is the history of the Taj Mahal or the Ajanta and the Alayas or the uh, Tanjo Temple, etc. Variables which essentially guide you and provide you with the necessary walk to tour, for example, of Hampi. Natural UI. Natural UI is very interesting because 
you know, some time back, I was actually looking at what uh, the son of a friend of mine was doing. He was standing in, you know, he, as a child, he essentially grew up on an iPad. And this whole idea of uh, moving from one screen to the other is essentially swiping the screen. So, uh, you know, by the time he became three years or four years old, he started watching cartoons on television. So one day I was sitting at his house and he was standing in front of the television and doing this. And I was wondering what, what was he trying to do? And then I realized he'd become so used to essentially using the natural user interface to change from one thing to the other. He was hoping that the television would change channels when he essentially moved his hands or tried to scroll through the whole process. And then, of course, the whole social media impact that we have. People today want to be seen, want to be heard. They you know, essentially think that they have a say in the larger scheme of things, which, and which is actually true, which is what social media has given us. The analytics that we essentially derive from all this, from the mobilization, virtual reality, augmented reality, et cetera, that analytics is finally going to decide as to how the hospitality industry is going to move forward. The application of the technology that I talked about, you know, mobile, I don't have to talk to you, we, we all know how we, today we use mobile phones, right? Literally everything that we do is on a mobile phone. Virtual reality, uh, you know, I was actually associated with the creation the virtual reality walkthrough tour for two things in Kerala, under Kerala tourism. One was the Jagayu Park, and the other one was the, the Gujarati uh, street in Alaki. Because people really want to experience that first that place first in virtual reality before they go ahead, go ahead and uh, you know visit that place for real. Augmented reality. I've already told you the uh, uh, the the example of where it can be put to use the wearables, natural UI, etc. So in many ways, this. Ladies and gentlemen, is the way that uh, technology is going to shape our industry in my uh, uh, I see an annotation request. Um, I, I, I'm not very sure what is expected of me. Once I finish, maybe you can have that uh, question, Dr. Jaden. Certainly, sir. We will uh, we will take up questions after you finish your session. At sure. the end of the session. Sure. <clears throat> so, in many, this is essentially going to be the way that the hospitality industry will look at technology. But I am personally of the opinion that we need to essentially focus on some of the fundamentals that we have and that we inculcate in our future leaders of the hospitality industry. Technology can only play a role of a facilitator, and in can do a lot of things depending on uh, the, the, the generation that you are born in and the resonance of the technology to, to the generation that you are born in is essentially dependent on the level of comfort that they have with the technology. Ones that uh, uh, are going to use hotels. So we need to strike a fine balance between what is too much of technology as well. See, at the end of the day, a person speaking to you essentially has more value than a person communicating to you over a virtual device. That level of empathy, that level of service, the, what, what makes the best of the hotels stand apart? It is because we essentially make sure that th those hotels make sure that the associates essentially have the ability to take decisions. And that decision-making process is not something that we are going to leave to artificial intelligence, for example. You know, most people talk about singularity being just around the corner. There is no such thing because at the end of the day, the machines cannot empathize. Every human being empathizes differently. So people are going to be intrinsic to the future of our industry. Technology will facilitate, will enable communication. It will ena enable dialogues, digilogues, will enable experiences for sure. But finally, it is that person-to-person -person interaction that is going to be extremely important in the way that the hospitality industry moves forward. Of course, there are significant areas where that person to person interaction no longer exists. And in many ways, they are not needed as well. It could be potentially redundant because of the fact that the machine can do a better job than the human and that too objectively and consistently. But like I said, subjectivity is what differentiates us from the rest of the species in the animal kingdom. The ability to come to a conclusion based on balance of consideration, that makes us very, very unique. And that is essentially the empathy that is also needed when we are essentially trying to communicate the hospitality as a service to people. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. I can talk on for the next three hours if you want me to, but I think uh, that will be too much of a verbal diarrhea from my side. So I'm more than happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.
Thank you very much, Mr. Ajit. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more questions to come in. Meanwhile, thank you for uh, demystifying the myth that uh, you know robots can take over uh, the front line, especially. Sure, thank you. Um, the first question I would uh, like to ask you: cryptocurrency, although uh, violet now, sorry, volatile now is often termed as the future of finance and market and banking. What is your take on this and will it have any impact on the hospitality industry? See, cryptocurrencies will continue to be traded in the secondary market till such time the governments essentially come up with the financial status guideline with regards to how cryptocurrency can be used. Today, yes, there are secondary markets in which cryptocurrencies are traded, but till such time it becomes mainstream. I don't think we need to worry about the impact that cryptocurrency will have because there are worldwide governing institutions right from the European Union to the United, United Nations World Trade Organization to individual countries that have their own monetary policies. So I don't think cryptocurrency is going to become something uh, very, very important in this industry as a uh, Possible uh, uh, term of use uh, in terms of uh, the ability to pay using cryptocurrency. But is that something that we need to look for? Absolutely, because technology keeps evolving every day. We do need to be cognizant of the fact that at some point in time, this will become ubiquitous. Today, but till such time, the governments of the world and the equivalent uh, of the RBIs of the world do not have that traded as public uh, uh, tender. I don't think we need to be worried. But the basis of cryptocurrency is a technology called blockchain. And that is very important because that is something that you can use to ensure that your data is 100% secure. And that is a technology that is now used by most uh, solution providers to ensure that the data is secure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions coming up. The first question is from Mr. Sarvanan, Dr. Sarvanan. He's saying, is the uh, virtual reality, we are head sets available in India. What is the approximate cost of VR headsets here, sir? Sure. Dr. Sarvanan, absolutely, VR headsets, headsets are very much available in India. Uh, you can essentially pick it up from uh, Microsoft. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, there are a bunch of others. Google also makes Google, uh, headsets. But if you're looking to use virtual reality to uh, perpetuate, uh, let's say, education, you don't need to go into one of those uh, complex headsets. What you can do is essentially buy a box uh, through which your mobile phone itself can be converted into a virtual reality headset. So you can, if the software is essentially on your mobile phone, the virtual reality headset is nothing more than a plastic piece, which will probably cost you 700 rupees on Amazon. It comes from China. It is, uh, so uh, um, it is a software that is more, more important in the virtual reality space than the hardware itself, because the hardware is primarily your phone. I mean, today virtual reality and often reality has come to a stage where it is more software driven than it's hardware driven. All right. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Prakash. In the hospitality industry, more than high tech marketing, it's better to have high touch marketing. What is your say on this? High touch can essentially run through high tech. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Because high touch essentially requires two people to come face to face to converse, etc. Without doubt. From the element of uh, services as we provide it as a product, high touch is very, very important. But getting out the message about the high touch, high tech is probably the only thing because you need to be able to communicate to the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. So the content is important in terms of what you communicate and how you communicate. Uh, so these are not necessarily independent of each other. They are very much a part and parcel of the which has now evolved into a digital. Thank you for that, sir. Our next question is from Mr. Zakaria. How do you go about uh, creating a digital product from the concept to a final product? How long does it take? Sir, it uh, completely depends on the product. <laughs> well, you're talking about a hospitality product? Yes, most probably a hospitality product. Okay. So hospitality product, a simple uh, example of that is OEM. 
right? What did Oyo do? Oyo essentially became the Uber of the hospitality industry. What they did was they picked up the, uh, what is otherwise a very fragmented industry, created a layer of technology and profit, which aggregates it, and provided it with a basic marketing uh, uh, persona, which enables people to understand that there's a standardization of process across, right? So that wouldn't have taken them too much time. But on the other hand, if you were to take the solution that I have now created, along with my co-founders of the team in Bangalore, we are a hardcore technology platform. It's a mixture of computer vision, uh, deflectivity. Uh, it's a subset of what we call artificial intelligence. Now that is essentially dependent on the machines learning to a level where it becomes objective and consistent. That entire journey took us close to about three and a half years for the system to first and foremost identify that this is metal, plastic, and glass. Then to identify defect and damage of that. Then to identify the forms that will be created by this. In, in one of the industries that we cater to, which is automotive industry, um, the outside rear mirrors of cars, almost 35% of outside rear mirrors of cars in this world are manufactured by one company called Madhusan. So whether you're driving a Maruti or a Maserati, the chances are the ORVMs have been created by one guy. But there are things that happen. And obviously, the ORVM of a Maruti is very different from that of a Maserati. So we need to our system to learn that this is the difference of the ORVM and a Maruti and versus a Maserati. That takes more time. The other thing is that systems learn much like humans, zero to 70. Very quickly, we learn. Then you need to unlearn. Then you need to relearn. Then you need to relearn with nuance. And then you need to essentially understand what needs to be excluded from the balance of concentration before you come to a decision. So that incremental, so in, in, in many ways, it's like an asymptotic curve, right? 70. Four to 70, 75 percent is very, very quick. And then that incremental one percent is very difficult. So if you have to pick a product from scratch to where it is today, to take my own example of camp um, the initial uh, nine months uh, was essentially manually annotating each one of these images, saying, okay, this is metal, this is plastic, this is glass, etc. Then we got the once the system hit a certain amount of accuracy, we essentially told the system, okay, now we have understood this. Now you add and we, then we told the system, okay, now you will make and you will check. And then over a period of time, we started reinforcing that learning. So that reinforcement learning essentially comes from what we call exclusion knowledge. So uh, the system started identifying, okay, because the initial annotation said that this is, a, uh, for example, a bear, or this is a bird poop, or this is a, a somebody's hand. Now you need to tell the system, okay, no, now you have learned it to a level. Think about it as when we move from, uh, uh, you know, your, uh, your PU to your degree, to your master's, to your PhD, right? Things are much like that. Once we get to particular stage, then we essentially start excluding what we don't want and coming back to crux of the problem saying, okay, no, this is where it is and this is where it is. So it could take very, it could be done very quickly or it could take years as my case let us. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, our next question is from Mr. Uh, Dr. Sarvanan again. Are tourism companies and hotels in India providing virtual reality and augmented reality to guests? Uh, if I may ask Dr. Sarvanan, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality of what? You know, because typically we tend to use virtual reality as an enticement, which is essentially to give the an idea of an experience before they go out and uh, experience it on the road, on the ground. Augmented reality is more used in operations automation and while you're on the ground. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, virtual reality, for example, if you wanted to have a sneak peek of the Jatandu Park in Kerala, the virtual reality uh, assets are available for that. You can essentially walk through that place virtually. But once you land in Jatayu Park, then your mobile, which is augmented reality enabled, becomes your guide. So when you hold up the mobile phone to the Jatayu uh, uh, statue there, then starts collecting that data and essentially saying, okay, Jatayu is from uh, this era. These are the, this is the reason why Jatayu is important. This is how he saved Sita. This is how he, uh, you know, essentially fought with Ravana and so on and so forth. So virtual reality and augmented reality are at different phases of the experience. Virtual reality is the enticement. Virtual reality is essentially the, uh, in many ways, the one that provides you with the extra additional information that you need when you're on the ground. So in many ways, think about it as pre and post. So pre is before you land at the site 
and post or rather during when you when you are in the True, India is really catching up fast on uh, all these technological advances. Dr. Thomas, actually, India has been a pioneer in a lot of these technologies. You know, in many ways, we are not catching up fast. We have been pioneers in a lot of these technologies. Great, thank you to know that. Sir. All right, the next question is uh, from Ms. Sri Lakshmi. The hospitality industry is known for host hosting vast amount of data, storing and processing it to operate. This automatically makes this industry a significant target to cyber threat. What is, uh, how are we prepared to face this? Man, very good question. Cyber security is something, if I, if I were to tell you that that's a way in which all our data can be protected, I would be lying. You know, any government that tells you, any platform that tells you that your data is 100% protected is lying. Okay, there is no such thing uh, as 100%, right? Um, Look at it from this perspective. Today, uh, we we have end-to-end -end encryption on WhatsApp messages, the messages that we keep sending to each other. Can it be broken? 100% it's As a matter of fact, today we are on Cisco WebEx. Cisco WebEx is actually one of the most uh, uh, secure platforms for uh, uh, video communication. This has been broken multiple times. So, you know, it is not like there is a, 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 a there's no gold standard when it comes to security in as far as data is concerned. There will be breaches, after all, that is what I said, human ingenuity. Human ingenuity knows no bounds, right? If we could spend, send Sputnik up using technology infrastructure that, uh, you know, as essentially more than what we have on a mobile phone. And on a mobile phone, we essentially chat with each other rather than thinking about how to send Sputnik. Human ingenuity will you know the way it is continuing. But at the same time, there will be checks and balances that will come in place, which enables, to a certain extent, uh, you know, safeguarding of that data. The thing about the hospitality industry, unlike what a lot of people think, the data is not all stored in one place. You know, because of the way we are, technology has evolved within the hospitality industry, we have vast silos of data. So, you know, it's, a lot of our data is, I mean, take a simple example of a hotel. If I'm not mistaken, there are about 47 different systems in a hotel. Okay, everything from your property management system to your sales and catering system to your point of sale system, your building management system, your financial accounting system, so on and so forth. And each one of them is essentially a separate repository. You know, system interoperability is something that exists in today's world. But have the hotels actually got to that level, for example, in the retail space where Amazon today makes more money selling the data about us, the, uh, the, the, the apparel and the shoes and uh, groceries that they sell us, right? At the end of the and their uh, bulk of their money is coming from our data. That is because they have architected the system that way. Hospitality industry honestly hasn't reached that phase. So I wouldn't be that worried about it. But this is something. Sir, sorry for that, sir. That's sorry. a small uh, disruption in between. I'm sorry. Continue, sir. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the short answer to your question is no, nobody is safe. The long answer to your question is what I said earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next question is uh, the hospitality industry being built on physical assets. According to you, um, are there any elements of business that shows potential to be NFTs? NFTs. Uh, just a moment. Oh, forgive my ignorance. Uh, what did you mean by NFT? I'll just check. So just a moment. It's um, non-fungible tokens. Okay? Sorry? Non-fungible tokens. Non-tangible. Non-fungible tokens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, sir, I should be honest with you. I don't know much about non fungible tokens, so I probably may not be able to answer that question. But I can definitely look it up, uh, speak to people who know better than me. As I said, you know, I have a hotelier for me, Java is good coffee, it's got nothing to do with technology. I have a passive observer, but I will definitely uh, come back to you. I will, uh, uh, you know, find out what it is and its implications. But, uh, Dr. Thomas, can you uh, read out the rest of the question, please? Yes, yes, um, I'm just going to the next question. Um, no, no, say the same question before uh, he asked about non fungible tokens. It takes hospitality industry being built on physical assets. According to you, are there any elements 
of the business that shows potential to be non fungible tokens. Okay. Uh, if I answer the first part of the question, the non fungible tokens part, I'll come to. The hospitality industry today, actually, in many ways, is not a physical asset intensive industry, right? We look at the typical way that the hospitality industry operates. A REIT essentially owns the uh, data state and the building and everything else associated with it. There is a management company that manages day to day operations, and there, there is a flag or the branch that essentially cap the, the label of which is put outside. At times, the uh, the, um, the flag and the management company could be the same. In the United States, it's hardly the case. There are, you know, most of the time, there's a separate management company and a separate. Uh, the problem is that you get to approach those physical assets that we have, and especially so the larger brands. Do you know how easy it is to convert from a data to a Marriott in the US? It takes two days. <laughs> you know, all you do is essentially change the coding outside. Because the SOPs have been driven down to a detail where it's become so cookie cutter that most clients have no individual. So that is something that the world is moving away from. Now, the, the way the physical assets and the, uh, the, the ability to derive ROI from physical assets is something that is being looked at very, very seriously across the market. So what I call the uberization of physical infrastructure. And that is what OYO has done, right? OYO does not own any of these attacks. They have essentially just provided uh, a branding and a basic SOP to them. The physical infrastructure business essentially has a specific ROI that is expected based on net present value of capital and so on and so forth. What comes on top of that? I mean, a simple example of that would be the Four Seasons City, one of the most preeminent high end uh, five star deluxe properties in the world. They own only 3%. Of the total revenues that is operated as a you know as a hotel by them anywhere in the world, that is their business model. They own nothing, essentially. But but the brand Four Seasons and the quality standards associated with Four Seasons and the ubiquitousness of technology and the human warmth that comes for the discerning people. Over a period of time, I think whole disintermediation is going to become more and more pervasive in the way that we even look at hotels in India. Now, Obrace has always been very, very keen that they own the physical asset rather than just manage the physical asset. Melila was another one. Now they have both moved away. They have started operating hotels, they have started managing hotels. I think we'll see more of that because today a hotel is not just about a place where you go and sleep for the night or you have XYZ uh, comforts when you decide to stay overnight. No. It's a social it's a social hub, it's a commune for like-minded people. And that is where I talked about the unbundling of services. A simple example here is Rove Hotels, which is run by the Imar Group here in, in Dubai. Rove is what they call the smart hotel for the smart set. The rooms are um, in many ways uh, following the, the, the Scandinavian thing of utilitarian. Uh, 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 yeah, it, it, it's fairly utilitarian, but at the same time, very comfortable. Um, the restaurant they have is open for everyone, but it, it's almost like a deli. Okay, there's nothing being prepared. You essentially go and pick up whatever you want, and if you want to heat it up, you can go ahead and heat it up. If you want, uh, you don't want to open your room, they have a specific area where you can essentially go ahead and register, and even your company can register. So, Home Hotels today offers workspace for entrepreneurs, and the Dubai government essentially enables you to register your company using a hotel address. So I think we are going to more of that in many ways with the hospitality asset, the physical asset space, more and more. I mean, to give you, uh, to go back to a previous example that I mentioned, I had written to the Kerala government and I saw the news article about them trying to set up near home centers. For so what? I mean, the Kerala government, because of a lopsided alcohol law, essentially enabled the creation of hotels of what they claim to be three-star standards across literally every village in Kerala. Good thing is that it offers very good infrastructure. Yes, there are demands in every uh, flow, but that's okay. Because at the end of the day, the infrastructure can be used by any one of these road warriors who are currently working from home and can essentially enlarge in the scope of the economy of that specific market. So I don't know if I've answered your question, sir, but I think uh, the non-fungible token part, I don't know, so I'll come back to you. But this was the previous part of your question. I hope I have answered it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. It was very well said. Uh, the next question is for Mr. Maram. 
It says all cities are crowded and smart cities will take time to develop. Don't you think that customers want to experience nature with basic needs available rather than staying in four walls, walled buildings, which all of us have been living anyway? Heritage and rural tourism is what everyone is seeking, especially after uh, this horrid times and they have gone through uh, during COVID-19 and lockdown. So, absolutely, sir. There is no denying that. But we look at the statistics that are coming out in terms of that there is a push back into the cities. And the reason for that is because business travel is picking back up again. It is not necessarily because thanks to COVID, a lot of us have been affected financially because of uh, you know whatever has happened over COVID. So people are essentially moving, going back into the cities largely for, and this is being led by business. This is being led by business. But on the other hand, also remember that COVID had another effect on people who are living in cities. A lot of them moved back home. You know, I used to work in Wipro Technologies area and approximately 60% of the 165,000 people that are employed by Wipro essentially moved back to their native places during the COVID lockdown. That essentially means they are very much living, you know, within four walls, yes, but in a much more salubrious environment than living in an apartment in Bali. So the, the, the nature, uh, the natural part of it is that when they have to move that move, make the shift back. And now nowadays most people are saying, okay, we'll just stay in our villages, no problems because. You know, it also takes care of one of the biggest issues that India has been facing, which is old parents living alone. So now you have the children back home, but when they have to go back to the uh, to the cities, that that is essentially now opening out, and people are starting to move back there. So the and the hotels have essentially changed the way that they have essentially offered their services till now. So today you do not find them saying, "Okay, this is just bed and breakfast." You know, okay, Wi-Fi is free anyway. Wi-Fi is free in most hotels, but bunch of the other bundling of services that you would typically find outside earlier no longer exist but yes do people want to go back i mean a simple example is uh, uh, um, zoho the founder of zoho who has essentially moved out of chennai and gone back to his old uh, village and where he's setting up new centers i think we are going to see a move from the larger cities to the smaller cities because let's let's take for an example i mean if you are from a small village in uh, i'm from kerala so if i go back to my village in manan for example um who are the most important people in that society? There is a panchayat president, there is the, uh, uh, you know, the local doctor, the local engineer, the local bank manager, etc. Now put 10 techies from Bangalore into that mix. He will essentially create his own little paradise thing. So that means the ripple effect of the economy that will happen in a place like Mandanam is going to be way more than the ripple effect of the same spend if they were to do in Bangalore. In Bangalore, you could spend a, a crore and a half and buy an apartment, it's just, it's just an apartment. But in Mandanam, in his own ancestral house, if he decides to buy a house, that is just 50 lakhs. And the uh, the latent uh, 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 employment that gets accrued to it, the ecosystem that they build around it, the people who start visiting them. So these places, the tertiary cities, the, the tertiary towns, the villages, are going to become more and more intelligent as we move forward. right? Because honestly, India today has the cheapest 4G in the world. So, so uh, if I'm not mistaken, we pay less than 10 paisa per GB of data. Do you know how much I pay here in uh, Dubai for a GB of data? 12 dirhams. <laughs> That's 240 rupees. So that, that is a kind of ubiquitousness of uh, uh, 4G and now, of course, moving on to 5G that we have. When we talk about smart cities, smart cities are not necessarily just about the infrastructure being smart. It is about the people leveraging the bandwidth that is available to make the places that they are in smart. Very well answered. So thank you so much. Uh, our next question is uh, products like, uh, I think Vasundra is asking this, uh, products like Digi Valley are AR and your views on that. See, my biggest problem with the hospitality industry product um, set and as I mentioned earlier, is because I think there is way too much, um, way too many systems to run one single hotel. Okay. No, hotels typically are behind the hype cycle when it comes to adoption of technology. We adopt technology at a stage where it's become so mature and it's on its way down. We rarely adopt technology. We are not early adopters. And that, is, that essentially leads to a situation where 
the, by the time you have adopted the technology and you have come to a level where it should essentially start paying off, you have already started going downhill because there is some something new again. DG values have been as a concept, as a technology, as a solution has been around for, if I'm not mistaken, at least 10 to 12 years now in multiple ways. Uh, some of them are augmented reality enabled, some of them are not augmented reality enabled. But finally, there is this whole concept in our minds as hoteliers, and this I, this essentially comes from the fact that even in hotel school, right, when we tell people that, okay, why 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 do we have to specialize in F&B service? Why do we have to specialize in, in housekeeping? Why can't we have an eagle's eye view of this whole thing and essentially understand how this impacts us all across the board? Because finally, it is not just about your little silo that is contributing to the business. It is the entire guest experience and the total value that you essentially derive from a customer that defines the hospitality experience and you define the hospitality ROI. Technology should not be seen as something that you need to have just because somebody else has it. It should definitely pay for itself in multiples, others do not amount. Because technology in, it, in, in its own does not in any way take care of any issues that you have. It needs to necessarily be put to a business case. That business case has to have an ROI. You know, I keep telling people, if the technology does not increase your rev par by 3%, don't even go for it. What is the point in doing that? Go back to the basics of our industry and say that, does technology fit in? If it does not, it makes no sense. Thank you very much for your view, sir. Our next question is from Mr. Zakaria again. Uh, sometime back, there was a lot of interest shown in trinary logic and computers, but we do not hear about it in what went wrong. Uh, multiple things, uh, sir. Uh, the whole concept of AI, ML, neural networks, etc. essentially have kind of pushed trinary logic to the back, to the, to, to the back in many ways. It is largely because of the uh, ability of uh, computers to do uh, quantum jumps in terms of the number of teraflops that it can handle. Now, neural networks have been found to be better uh, than trinary logic because it has the ability to mimic uh, the human uh, uh, you know, thinking process. But then again, like I said earlier, I mean, are we looking at singularity any point in, any point soon? No, the answer is no, it is not. Uh, artificial intelligence is a very vast subject. You know, under that, you have multiple subsets because artificial intelligence is essentially about the ability to get a machine to think like a human. And our faculties are our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our touch, our skin, etc. Now, um, if you look at uh, a simple example of uh, the, my chosen subset of artificial intelligence, which is computer vision, what does computer vision typically get used for? It's used for three things. It is you know, much like any other product, right? people, place, and product. So for people being done to death, right? I mean, literally every government in this world has spent enough and more money on surveillance systems, the ability to identify people. And that is where the most amount of money has gone because it's, it's a matter of national security. Look at place. Place, the most common example that I can give you is uh, Google Maps, oh, sorry, Google Lens and its integration to Google Maps. So if I'm standing in, for example, uh, uh, in front of Vidan Sauda, I turn on my Google Lens and turn to uh, Vidhan Sauda, it automatically starts picking up data from Google Maps and from Google and essentially provides me all the details that is needed about Vidhan Sauda. It could even tell me, you know, on floor number one, uh, 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 Mr. Siddharamaya sits or on floor number three, so and so sits. That is about the place. And then there are products, right? And which is which is the space that I have chosen. Um, products, uh, by its very nature, because like I said, visual inspections have, you know, for the longest time have essentially been human intensive, have been, uh, obje have, have been subjective and not necessarily something that can keep up with in this pre-COVID days, the necessary need to be uh, uh, contactless and of course to future proof that process. Um, within these, within the subset of computer vision, we have machine learning and we have neural networks and we have NLPs and a bunch of other technologies also that help drive the computer vision space. So these have now reached a level where there's a certain amount of um, saturation, if I may use that word. And to certain, to certain, and the reason why that saturated is because it has come to a level where it cannot learn quick enough. The, the delta increment that you get in terms of its ability to learn is different. So right now we are also working with uh, the government, uh, uh, sorry, with the university in Israel and with IIT Delhi and Indian Institute of Science to try and see if we can essentially create new models that would enable faster learning. 
So hopefully we will have the next quantum jump in the next uh, seven to eight weeks. Thank you, Mr. Nair. Our next question, if not the last, would be uh, a large number of fast food brands like the Wendy's and the KFCs often tend to assign a certain human personality to their social media presence. Do you think this form of marketing is something that hotels should get into? No, I think they should have a human there. <laughs> because creating a persona for a chatbot is kind of counterproductive. Because, you know, at the end of the day, people are not stupid. They understand that uh, the, though the persona may be that of a human, you are essentially chatting to a chatbot. And uh, you, you realize at the moment you essentially throw a question that is out of the ordinary to that chatbot. Um, hotels, I think, should essentially and necessarily tread that middle path of understanding where the human is, where the machine is, how much of technology, or where to not use technology. And I think that is essentially going to be the redeeming factor for us coming out of COVID. Dr. Thomas, for the simple reason, I mean, think about it. We have all been cooped up at home, you know, essentially looking at our uh, spouse's face or our children's face for the longest of time. I'm sure most of you will agree that, that many a time you essentially wanted to throw them off the balcony because of the amount of time that you spent with them. So human beings crave attention. They crave the ability to be in conversation with somebody. And that is never going to go away. That is just the way we are. And the hospitality industry cannot do away without humans. Like I said, the technology will enable, the technology will facilitate, the technology can make things easier for you, but understand where it can be put to use. Can technology replace humans? Yes, it should replace humans where the humans do not do the job well. But that does not take away from the fact that if a sommelier, for example, who's going to go there and essentially tell you what wine to pair with the dish that you've used, <coughs> a robot is only going to read out a list of names. But the sommelier, a trained sommelier, will look at the person and understand that, okay, this, you know, based on appearances, based, that is the whole subjectivity that comes into play, right? Based on the person, where is he from? I mean, uh, you know, for example, if you're Italian, would you like to be the, the, the best uh, wine that has to be paired with as a German? No, I don't think so. So, you know, those are things, those are things that only a human can do. And so we Sorry, a small disturbance. Here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is uh, very well taken. Uh, I think we uh, don't have uh, many more questions coming in, but I would like to ask you, um, what is the future of wearable technologies and also virtual conferences? Do you think it's here to stay? Ma'am, virtual conferences, I think, are here to stay. Virtual conferences are definitely here to stay. But again, you know, okay, I'm a salesman, right? I, I essentially sell technology. During the COVID lockdown and subsequent era, <laughs> just uh, before I came to Dubai, I'm sitting in front of a Teams, you know, on a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting or a WebEx meeting or a Meet meeting and talking to people, right? In today's world, everybody's, most of the time, they're working from home. So they obviously uh, don't want to show you the background. So they say immediately after the introductions, oh, I think there's some latency issue. Let me switch off my camera. And here I am sitting and talking to this person, literally a bank, blank wall, right? I'm going through the whole process. I don't know body language. I have no eye contact. I don't even know how that person is reacting to what I'm saying or responding to what I'm saying. How am I supposed to close a deal? You cannot close a deal without actually seeing that person in, in place. For all you know, during that entire 25 minutes or 30 minutes that you talked, you were watching Netflix <laughs> because you don't know what happened, right? And at the end of the conversation, they'll say, oh, we'll get back to you, don't worry. And then that, that is where it is. So I came here on the 4th of December to attend uh, GTEx, the Health Information Technology Exposition and Conference, which was the last and the most major conference that was held in person uh, last year. That conference was in many ways an eye opener for me. There was a, a, a virtual presence for that, of course, because a lot of people from around the world could not travel. But the kind of uh, participation that came here locally from this market was huge. I have never seen those number of people attending GTEx before. So I, you know, there is going to be a balance in terms of the virtual meetings. Uh, I think a virtual conference, to a large extent, if it does not require <coughs> too many people, yes, but a trade conference where people essentially expect to get into details and then subsequently close deals. 
I think it's still going to be largely driven by uh, uh, by face to face. Thank you, thank you so much. I hope all this just uh, you know finishes off us and we come back to reality soon. Thank you. Amen. Uh, we'll take the last uh, question. How important is the role of ethics when it comes to software desi designers working on machine learning? Is from Usha, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, machines don't have ethics. Ethics are taught by humans to machines. Right? So it essentially depends on the human because human, the machine is not learning anything on its own. I mean, you reinforce learning at some point. Yes, there's a certain amount of self-learning that is essentially defined by the human when it is teaching them. So a machine essentially mimics a man or a woman or you know the human species. So it can be as ethical as the human that decides it or as unethical as the human that trains it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We had wonderful insights uh, during this presentation. We've learned a lot of new things, a lot of new terms, a lot of things that we can take back with us. We thank you very much for the session, Ms. Sajid. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Thanks a lot, sir, uh, for this very interesting session. So we would look forward for many more from you. Always a pleasure to talk to the you know the mentors of the next generation of hospitality, and uh, I hope you continue to do a good job. Like I've said, I'm a failure by vocation and passion, but unfortunately, I'm on the wrong side. <laughs> so, so I hope at some point in time I'll be able to come back to the industry and hope to try to use cases.